welcome back to Decouple. And welcome back for another masterclass featuring the one and only Mark Nelson. So far we have covered natural gas, we have covered coal, petroleum is yet to come, but by popular demand. Today we tackle the magical stardust, uranium itself. Mark Nelson, it's, uh, it's been a long time coming on this one. You spent a lot of time researching a topic that you're already intimately familiar with. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to what comes out today. So welcome back. Thank you very much. One of the things you, you learn when you learn is that there's always more to learn. Uh, however much you think you know, that's just the substrate for the next uh, set of lessons, in my opinion. So, I mean, we're calling this a masterclass. We're also calling it the Insanium Uranium Explanium. Mark, where do we get started? I think. Well, I mean, we, we, can, we can go back billions of years here, right? I mean, let's go back just to 1789 and talk about it. Right. right. So the discovery of uranium was done by a very early chemist who, like many of the earliest natural scientists, didn't start as a scientist. He started as a drug maker, an apothecary keeper. That was uh, William Klaproth, the uh, German chemist. And in 1789, he discovered uranium while messing around with samples of the mineral that was then called pitch blend, because it was a very dark, heavy rock. And so we have the irony that, especially considering the recent closure of nuclear plants in Germany, that it was Germans in Berlin who discovered uranium, the fuel that once powered much of Germany, and I believe will in the future too. <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating to look at the periodic table and to see how it became populated over the years. Um, uranium, the heaviest naturally occurring element on said table. Um, what's, what's so special about it, Mark? Well, you said part of it yourself right there. It is the heaviest naturally occurring element in significant quantities. We used to be able to say the heaviest naturally occurring element, uh, but we've had to add a phrase because it turns out that some tiny amount of plutonium uh, comes to us on the Earth's surface because of bombardment with waves from outer space, but a tiny amount is formed and it decays quite rapidly. So there's a, a, a just a trace quantity of this plutonium being formed and uh, falling away at the same rate. It's uranium that's by far the most abundant, uh, super heavy element on the earth. Now, and when we say abundant, um, I want to know how abundant because, you know, I've, I've um, in, in my community, there's been anti-nuclear folks going around. We have a pelleting plant for candor reactors, just taking natural uranium, making little pellets out of them. And one of these factories is, you know, not far from a school and anti-nuclear activists have gone by and said, a, you know, a single, you know, essentially an atom could wander and find its way into your lung and, you know, bombard the surrounding tissue with alpha radiation and kill your child. Um, and so, I mean, I was looking into just how, how abundant uranium is, you know, in general throughout the continental crust. And we're going to talk about obviously the hot spots right here in uh, Team Canada. But how, how abundant is uranium? It's about two to four parts per million in the Earth's crust and about I think it's something like three parts per, uh, a little bit less than that in seawater, but boy, there's a lot of seawater. So although that doesn't sound like much, uh, that actually makes it 50 times more common than silver and 500 times more common than gold. Admittedly, we do not use up gold for energy, but it's still interesting to compare the amounts. So where are we going, where are we going now, Mark? Um, I'm, I'm eager, to, eager to dive into the deep past, but uh, we started with the discovery. Where are we heading to now? Well, first, I think we should note that what, what's special about uranium that ends up mattering for us on Earth, for energy, about that stability part, that stable part is interesting. Turns out most of the elements as heavy as uranium tend to fall apart quite rapidly. They naturally decay into something else that's either more stable or itself decays again. So uranium is kind of special because although it's thick and chubby with neutrons in the form of uranium-238, it stays with us for some time. But let's talk about how we got it in the first place. So there are two theories about where much of Earth's uranium comes from. One is that a tiny amount of uranium that's present in something like, I think there's a one to one trillion ratio of uranium to hydrogen in our sun, which is dominated by hydrogen and helium fusion reactions. There's the tiniest amount of 
uranium in normal stars. And when those stars blow up, especially towards the end of their life, when they run out of enough lighter elements to fuse and they start accumulating more and more heavier elements that don't give off much energy when fused, the heat of the operation of the stars isn't enough to keep the star from collapsing gravitationally just due to its own mass, which then causes them to energetically blow up. So it's like a, a sort of a huff and a puff and then blam, you've got, you've got uranium headed out along with uh, quantities of other things like gold and, and the elements heavier than iron. These would be spewed out in supernova eruptions or supernova events. Now, there's another source of uranium, and that's when neutron stars, two neutron stars, these are stars that have fully, fully burned out and are basically just clumps of matter, uh, ultra, 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 ultra dense. Two of these stars can circle each other, circle faster and faster, and then combine and blam, form an immense amount of super heavy elements. It was these uh, one of these neutron and star interactions that was discovered using the gravity wave detector recently that was one of the most thrilling discoveries in modern physics. So these neutron stars smashing together act as factories for the super heavy elements of which new, uh, uranium 235 and 238, those are both referring to the number of protons and neutrons put together that would have been spewed out into the local areas of space. It's thought by scientists that uh, several of these dumping events, both supernova uh, eruptions and also the neutron stars collisions, could have led to the supply of uranium that we have on the Earth. That is, it wasn't just one blip. It wasn't just one moment. The ratio of uranium-235 to uranium-238 production supernova, I think it's something like 1 to 1 1.4 to 1. So at the beginning, there's pretty close to a similar quantities of uranium-235 and uranium-238. Now, uranium-238 is much more stable. It decays at about the rate of the current age of the Earth itself. What that means is it's got a half-life in the order of several billion years. That means after a few billion years, you can expect half of a quantity of uranium-238 to have decayed into other elements on the way to lead, basically. Whereas for uranium-235, the decay is much faster, meaning at the present moment in time, with the mixture of uranium that we have from various uh, highly <laughs> violent stellar events, about 99.3% of Earth's uranium is uranium-238, whereas 0.7% of Earth's current uranium is uranium-235. But it, like I said, it wasn't always that way. We got several dumps of uranium, and several billion years ago, we had uranium pockets with much higher concentrations of uranium-235. In fact, concentrations of uranium-235 that approach the amounts used in today's reactors, which in extremely special cases so far only discovered one spot on Earth in West Africa, in Gabon, in the mines near the uh, town of Oklo. We actually had naturally occurring nuclear reactors that operated under pretty much the same principle as our present day nuclear reactors. And what's interesting to me is they were discovered after the existence of such phenomena was predicted by a scientist, Paul Kuroda, about over a decade before. But I think we're still getting ahead of ourselves because although we've gotten Earth's supply of uranium from violent star interactions, deaths, collisions, we haven't yet learned how we get our supply of it. So uranium was distributed uh, in the Earth, the proto-Earth in rock, but it was evenly distributed and it needed to be concentrated into pockets for us to find in useful quantities, both to discover as an element uh, early on. If, it, if we hadn't found such large quantities stuck into pitch blend mineral, then it would have been unlikely that we would have found uranium until much later with much more sensitive equipment and much more thorough specific searches. But also, I, we would have 
struggle to recover amounts that would have been useful for nuclear energy, or for that matter, the original purpose of uranium nuclear bombs. So I'll go ahead and, and just put it out there. One of the things that scientists have known for a while, but I've basically never seen it put into such a clear story. Uranium is in pockets. Uranium was concentrated by life itself. While at the same time, the decay of uranium in the inside of the earth powers much of the convective force in the mantle that keeps volcanism alive, which is considered one of the primary things that helps protect and produce life on earth. And, and the magnetic uh, shield, I guess, right? Which prevents well, the atmosphere being stripped the, away from by the solar spinning, winds. Yeah, from a spinning core of, of the mantle, yes. But uh, it's quite important for volcanoes to exist because it keeps gases circulating and recirculating and drives continental drift and formation. So here's the, here's the story. Uranium has to become dissolvable in water for water to carry it to then deposit it at one spot. Otherwise, uranium's evenly distributed in rocks. And in fact, uranium has somehow found its way into continental rocks preferentially to its concentration in the, the magma from the mantle. So uranium was present in, the, in the, the molten rock, magma in the mantle, came out through volcanoes and ended up accumulating at higher concentrations in continental crust. I think that's quite interesting. And it turns out the reason why it was able to concentrate is because the water-soluble versions of uranium compounds required oxidation, and that oxygen was only made possible by uh, hundreds of millions of years of life giving off mass quantities of oxygen, more oxygen than the minerals in the Earth's crust could absorb through, not rusting per se, but oxidation, of which the most famous reaction is rust itself. This is the time of the cyanobacteria, the, one of the most disruptive uh, biological organisms on Earth, the bandied iron formations, um, you know, when, when all that, that uh, iron became oxidized and, and de deposited throughout the world's oceans and, and again, into those kind of commercially viable deposits of iron, I guess. So what you're saying is a similar thing happened with uranium and that life enabled the concentration of uranium to sustain future nuclear powered life. Is that what you're, you're getting at? Exactly. Here, it's, it's kind of a beautiful picture. Uranium came to the earth. It helps protect <laughs> life on earth. The life on earth produced oxygen, which allowed the concentrating of uranium into pockets where we can mine it and then use it to both flourish as a species, as a human species, while protecting the other life on earth by reducing our environmental impact, not just in terms of greenhouse gases, but spatially on the earth's crust. Well, I mean, you heard it here first, folks, on Decouple. This is a thesis. You know, I've been paying attention to the space for quite some time. You know, not just, you know, following great people on Twitter, but reading the great books of folks like James Lovelock and others. Uh, but this is a, a truly pretty novel idea, Mark. Did you just, I, again, I think this is something you came up with as your little uh, spiral of death occurred on the, the blacked out screen of your computer. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if somebody else has already made the point, but all the pieces are there. Uranium ended up on Earth from supernovas and neutron stars. It powers the Earth's continued uh, heat to avoid it cooling off and becoming sort of a dead rock. Life on Earth then provided the oxygen needed to concentrate uranium into deposits that let us mine it effectively to produce nuclear energy. And uh, as we move beyond fossil fuels, eventually um, we move into a, a, a nuclear powered world. And we're going to talk, I think, about, you know, how sustainable that is or not and about concerns about the finite nature of, of uranium as well. Um, but I think we've got um, other places to visit along our way on this journey. Um, are we ready to jump a little more into the attributes of uranium, its utility? Are we going to get into mining? What's, what's next, Mark? Well, I think we could go into something about how uranium ends up in those pockets that allow us to mine it. So there are 15 types of uranium. Uh, nuclear or uranium deposit identified by the IAEA. The two, by far the two most important are the ones that we're going to discuss. And they include most of the mines, say, in Kazakhstan and in Canada that are the source of most of the world's uranium. So 
how did the uranium get into these sweet spots in Canada, Kazakhstan, Australia? I mean, how, how localized are these, these uh, high concentration areas and what's special about them? Sometimes they're hyper localized. Like there's a bubble of uranium that's maybe a few hundred meters long and maybe 100 or 200 meters wide. And it's hyper concentrated right there at concentrations, uh, you know, hundreds of times other mines and thousands of times that of normal uranium concentrations in the earth. So the two most common best deposits for mining uranium are on one hand, unconformity deposits, and second, sandstone deposits. I'll mention sandstone deposits first. So sandstone is a permeable rock. Fluids can flow through it. Sandstone is, is where we get a lot of oil and gas, for example. And in the case of uranium, water flowing through sandstone carries uranium and other metals dissolved in the water, hits a patch where the water chemistry alters, and the uranium that had been carried along with the water drops out of solution. So rather than the oxidizing environment that allows uranium to form compounds that are water soluble and float along, it hits a reducing environment and, and it loses the ability to stay in the water and starts concentrating. So for example, in sandstones where this occurs, the grains of sand become covered in, in a coat of uranium minerals. Uh, uh, like uraninite. So what does this mean for us? That means that once you find sandstone, typically sandwiched between layers that are not permeable to water, you find a sort of a wave front of uranium flowing along and you need to find that, you need to gather that up and harvest it somehow. One of the most common ways, in fact, most of the uranium that is now mined around the world as of 2022, 2023, comes not from digging up the uranium burying sandstone and the uranium deposits themselves, but by sinking wells in front of and behind this wave of uranium, pumping through fluid that basically does the reverse operation. It carries, it dissolves out the uranium and flows it up through the, another well. Then this fluid bearing lots of uranium is pumped to a processing location. The uranium is stripped out and water is pumped back into the formation. Most of these formations have water that is just simply aquifers that are not drinkable. You cannot drink the water, the old water from these formations because they're extremely high in, well, radiation, dissolved heavy metals, sometimes other elements that are just not acceptable for human consumption. So you're not even altering, you're not involving yourself in water that either plants or animals would eventually end up using. But just in case this, so, this process called in situ recovery, ISR, is very careful about treating the water and putting in test wells in above and below the formation that has held this uranium for millions or billions of years and make sure that you're not leaking the processed water that you've put back in or the water with say the acid you might've used to recover the uranium, depending on the specific formation of rock that you're getting the uranium from, make sure you're not leaking it outside it's, the formation. It's a little bit like, you know, this is a big stretch, but a bit like no-till agriculture. You're not needing to do a big open pit mine. You're not needing to dynamite out tunnels and do hard rock mining. Um, it sounds like it's less invasive. There's still, you know, environmental uh, concerns to manage in terms of the water treatment, but you're not having to, you know, move around a huge amount of rock, um, which is, you know, such a, such a huge part of the energy use of mining and, and the environmental impact. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot to look at at mines like this, to be quite frank. There's no big hole. There's only a few structures on the surface. There's a few little things that look like miniature wellheads that are just the surface pumps. And yeah, the fact that this is over half of the uranium supplies that we're now getting out of the ground, which is approximately, uh, let's say, approximately half of uranium power that we're getting around the world, which is 10% of global electricity. This means a few hundred million people are getting electricity from mines that don't e wouldn't even be recognized as mines to the public. Okay, so you said sandstone um, was one of the big deposits. I was talking with a, a Canadian prospector 
Um, and as you were saying, I mean, the concentrations um, can be very variable. Canada has some really incredible ore, ore grades, some approaching 20%. But he was saying there's little pockets within these ore grades where you might be 60% uranium. And of course, we have this burn everything uh, reactor here in Canada called the Kandu. He was saying you could press these things into pellets and put them into a Kandu and, you know, wouldn't run as perfectly as if they were, you know, entirely uranium. But I mean, just I think this, this concept of how the ore grade can vary um, is pretty incredible. Um, average ore grade around the world, I think 0 0.07. Canadian ore grade up to about 20%. Now, how do things look over in Kazakhstan or other places around the world? How do they compete with Canada? Canada's got superlative ore. There's nothing like Canada, and that's why I can't, can't wait to get into this unconformity deposit uh, discussion because I, I went to Cigar Lake Mine, the mine currently producing essentially all of Canada's uranium, and I'm going to be able to describe that with first-hand knowledge. The deposits elsewhere are between 10 and 100 times less concentrated. So there's uh, means you need to mine 10 to 100 times more material to recover the same amount of uranium. Now, with in-situ recovery, you're not physically mining it out of the earth, but uh, it still, it's still involves... Um, I, I don't want to say that a mine is better, Chris, and the Canadian mines are better just because the uranium is so concentrated but it's hard to it's hard not to feel a little bit proud of our north american uranium production if i can say that as an american so for example the infamous mines in southwest united states the ones that were mined with let's just face it artisanal methods with all the health damages and safety risks associated these are the for example the navajo uranium miners that worked in horrible conditions and suffered health problems due to that. Well, these were mines that were much lower grade than the Canadian mines and were only being mined because of the US government's absolute insistence on self-sufficiency of uranium supplies for its nuclear weapons programs. Whereas uh, it was okay to get uranium for nuclear power reactors from other sources, the US government was very sensitive, as many governments would be, about getting essential elements for its its weapons for its uh, nuclear fleet from outside the United States. Otherwise, as soon as the price for uranium fell a bit in the 80s, all those mines shut down and we've been getting uranium from, co from Canada ever since. So discontinu discontinuity deposits, that was the second Unconformity. Unconformity. This is a, a term from geology referring to rocks that were laid down, that are sitting next to each other, but laid down at different times. And the deposits, these ultra high purity deposits in Canada, which so, for example, of Cigar Lake Mine, which is the mine I visited last summer, that has an average ore grade of 16% uranium with patches, little bits above 70%. If you could see these, these are almost pure uh, UO2, uranium dioxide, which ends up being what you need for nuclear reactors. Uh, you just have to process it to get the other stuff out, concentrate the UO. There's steps in between, and we'll get to that. So why don't I describe uh, why these unconformity deposits form? What I heard when I visited the good folks up in Saskatoon at Cameco, they say, you look for uranium where water once flowed. You're looking for deposits that concentrated lots of flows of water through a patch, a pocket, and you need something that trapped that pocket and changed the water chemistry at that pocket to precipitate out uranium in a very tight spot over a long period of time. And sure enough, that's where the ore body that makes up the Cigar Lake line, mine and the ore body that makes up the MacArthur River mine, which is the largest uh, single deposit of your high grade uranium ever di discovered with Cigar Lake being the largest in current production. So what happened basically is there's a pocket of rock, the basement rock that comes from uh, metamorphic rock from a very long time ago. Above that is sandstone. And those sandstone layers have imperfections that form the features we just mentioned. So like a, a clay cap that it's impermeable to water flow but uh, fault fracture lines that allow the water to flow in. And then these bed, this bedrock underneath allows uh, water to carry uh, water chemistry that precipitates out 
the uranium that's flowing in from the above, basically. And so it's like this pocket that traps and filters out the uranium, water keeps flowing onwards, and the uranium stays. And it just happened over an extremely long period of time, something like 1.6, 1.7 billion years ago. And there's a number of these pockets. We know that there's a bunch of these pockets, these ore bodies of high-grade uranium scattered across the Athabasca Basin, a formation that uh, underlies, say, northern Saskatchewan and a lot of the Canadian Shield. So we know that there are more of these ore bodies out there, but they're a little bit tricky to find. As you may know, Canada is very big. The formation where this might happen is very big, and it's a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. All right. Well, I think that's that's uh, going to help our prospecting nerds uh, understand a little bit more about you know where to find it, how it uh, concentrates. Uh, let's get on to some uh, other exciting material. Well, let, let's um, harvest it. That's let's harvest it. Where let's it talk is. about the mine. The mine visit. I, you know, I love and I love getting descriptions of people that have been there on the ground. You've you've described your awe at sort of visiting a coal plant and looking through that bit of tempered glass to see what's going on in the belly of the beast. What was it like uh, visiting Cigar Lake? You know what's terrible and I and I complained to my lovely host about this too I didn't get to see any uranium <laughs> I knew that the uranium in such high concentration concentrations would be this gorgeous black shiny sparkly mineral uh, or blend of minerals and I didn't get to see any Chris but that tells you something about how I don't know how pristine how clean how uh, self-contained this mining operation is so let me describe first how Cameco attempted to mine Cigar Lake and why that failed. So there's this uranium pocket in this waterlogged rock formation sitting above a hard rock basement. So the first attempt was to dig a big hole down, go right into the ore body and try to gather it up. But they, the mine walls kept collapsing in, that kept pressing in, water kept leaking in. There was nothing they could do to stop the, the ground literally from shifting not under their feet, but I guess around their feet uh, down in the tunnels. So this formation is taking place over 400 meters deep. So it's over 1,200 feet deep in the earth. And the pressure there is high such that when they gathered up the material out either to make the tunnel or to start mining the uranium, they couldn't keep the tunnel from collapsing. So they had to, they had to shut down and take a completely different approach. They had to invent a new approach just for that hyper-concentrated pocket of ore. And to give you a sense of how much uranium is there, there's about 99,000 tons of uranium if, if, once you concentrate it. It's enough to power the world's reactors for uh, a little over a year. Or putting it this way, at the current harvesting rates of uranium from Cigar Lake, uh, I think it's about 4,000 uh, 4, tons a year, or I guess about, sorry, about 4 million pounds a year. It's enough to power 300 terawatt hours of electricity production from modern reactors. So does that mean it's a big mine? No. I'm about to describe what they did to solve this really tricky colla tunnel collapse problem. But first I'll say that you can walk across the surface area of Cigar Lake Mine in just a few minutes. To get there, uh, you basically have to fly. So workers fly in for multi-day shifts and then fly out to uh, home. And it's still considered an absolutely outstanding job. And you're up in a uh, really stunning wilderness area, basically. It is a land of lakes and forests, sort of rolling bumpy hills and lakes as far as the eye can see. I've it was kind of intimidating to see this landscape because it kept going on and on and on. And I know Canada famously has the most lakes of any country. I think it's several million. Felt like you were seeing a bunch of them right there surrounding the mine. So there's a lot of water, and that means water quality and water protection is a very high priority. So here's how they solved the mine issue. They sunk a tunnel down below, below the basement bedrock. And that gives them the stability to be able to drill tunnels that don't collapse. But then they're stuck under the ore body. The ore body is above. Then they put dozens of wells to pump freezing solutions down to freeze the entire ore body into a solid shape to keep it rigid while they mine bits of it. Okay, good. So that's going to stabilize the, this waterlogged ore body filled with uranium uh, minerals. In fact, we might think of it as a little bit like a, a uh, 
a frappuccino, a mocha chip fra frappuccino, a frozen slurry of, of bits of uranium, water, and other rocks and minerals. So we've got our tunnels underneath, a frozen frappuccino of, of uranium above. Then they put in tracks to tunnels that go back and forth under the ore body itself. And this ore body, if I could rotate it around for you, it's sort of shaped like the, I think it looked like a lizard, but uh, the folks running the mine hadn't noticed that before and I don't think it's gonna stick, the lizard. So it also looks a bit like a modern airport arrivals hall, like a big arrivals hall, a couple of hundred meters long, um, sort of blob shape. So with the tunnels bored through the hard rock underneath and little rails installed to bring equipment in, then they drill directly vertically above their own heads, up through the little cap of, of base mat rock into the ore body itself, the frozen ore body. And then they stick in a little internal uh, pipe through this, through this tube and they spray ultra high pressure water combined with a few other, uh, say, gritty materials to help cut into this frozen uranium sediment. And then they spray in an arcing pattern and they just start pressure washing the inside of these cavities, basically, making a cylinder of of uranium slurry that is then sucked down through the tube, pumped to an area of the mine where it's allowed to settle a little bit, and then they put in thickeners and pump it back up to the surface. So that's, that, that's the point at which the straw is properly drinking the frozen frappuccino of uranium. Up at the surface, then the uranium is concentrated at a mill and is eventually turned into nuclear fuel. So these little tunnels have the drilling machines in them, putting pipes up, spraying with, with water at ultra high pressures to wash the uranium down into the straw and then piped around to the holding pin and then pulled up to the surface. And then finally, finally, each, each sort of straw suction hole is backfilled with concrete to stabilize the formation to prevent it from collapsing. So nature did all this hard work putting uranium in that one spot. You don't want it doing any movement or migrating that isn't you harvesting it. What are the, what are the kind of tailing ponds and things look like at a facility like this? There's very little compared to traditional mines. For one, the uranium is in concentrations of 16, 17% on average with spots of up to 70%. That means that relative to most mines, you're barely moving any material at all. So in fact, even though water is used to spray out these tunnels and to, to, uh, to move the mineral itself, each batch of water is tested for its, its purity after being filtered before being released from the mine. And then the tailing ponds themselves are quite, they're not even ponds, they're piles that themselves are tightly monitored. And, uh, and in fact, this makes an interesting situation. I've heard people say, wouldn't it be good if we got more minerals out of the tailings or if we extracted more or if we got different types of substances? Well, I asked the folks at Cameco at Cigar Lake about this and they said that the problem is they have such a specific permit and specific balance between uh, the the environmental regulators and how they accomplish their mission that they disturbing that by proposing to do anything with the tailings is a bigger paper risk a big paperwork risk than it is worth any minerals you might get out of it but yeah the tailings are there in a very specific area and it's known exactly how big the ore body is and how much is going to be taken out so they can size the tailings holding area very specifically long in advance okay Okay. Yeah, I hope to get up there one day and, and have a look for myself. So what's next, Mark? Where are we going to move to next? I think um, we've probably wrapped that section up in a bow. Um, once it gets out of the mine, it gets milled and gets to a power reactor and does, does the magic stuff. Uh, walk us through that. Yeah, so we can process. briefly mention those steps. Once it's coming, once the uranium concentrate or once the uranium ore uh, comes out of the mine, it goes to a mill in the mills. It's crushed further into very fine, uh, into, well, crushed into small particles. Then it's ground in even finer particles to make a maximum amount of surface area that then a substance, say sulfuric acid is the most common, 
would be used to extract specifically the uranium. And then that is dried and concentrated in the form of uranium, uh, triuranium octoxide, or U308, which we know as yellow cake. Why yellow cake? Well, it happens to be yellow at that oxidation state. And then this is the substance that, was, that can cause panic. For example, occasionally you hear, you know, 50 pounds of yellow cake missing from such and such. I, just a few weeks ago, that caused a panic. I remember hearing about yellow cake for the first time in the run-up to the Iraq war when it was used as one of the excuses. Saddam was getting yellow cake. This is the uranium uh, U308 that is the result of the mill. So it can't go into a reactor yet. Uh, I mean, it's nearly ready for can-do reactors, which are able to use this 99.3% U3 or U238, 0.7% U235 mix. But in most reactors on planet Earth, we need a higher concentration of uranium-235 to get the reactor going. And that's because the uranium-235 is more unstable, more likely to split, and starts your fission reaction with a lot smaller amount of fuel than is required if you had just uranium-238. And you can also use different substances in your reactor as opposed to a little bit more limited in what how you can run your reactor if you're running it off of natural uranium. You have to scrimp and scrounge every single neutron you can. You can't waste any, basically, if you're going to run off of natural uranium. So most reactors in the world include uranium concentration. What happens then is that U308, yellow cake, is turned into a gas, UF6, uranium hexafluoride. This is a very heavy gas that goes into canisters, and this gas then is fed into gas centrifuges. These gas centrifuges spin very quickly. Now, it's difficult to separate these two things because the chemistry, so the electron part, uh, is, base, is the same. It's the nucleus that's different. And to just give you an example of a property of uranium chemistry that has essentially nothing to do with the nucleus, I have a little bit of uranium glass here. So this used to be, this is an artifact, a precious artifact that really belongs in a museum. It was in the upstairs office area of environmental progress in Berkeley, California, where the pro-nuclear movement was practically launched by Michael Schellenberger from 2016 onwards. And this is what would hold piles of uh, cashew or pistachio shells as we worked on a difficult problem for two and then three and sometimes four hours in a row trying to untangle history and culture and engineering and physics all at once. So this is the dish that used to sit up and gather the pistachio shells. When the Environmental Progress Office is closed, sadly, as one of the many uh, victims of the pandemic, I was uh, ruthless in trying to obtain this. I think Michael may still want it back, but he can... Uh, Take it off of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just, for anyway, the people who are just listening, it's, it's fluorescing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fluorescing. And is, if I turn off the black light, it stops glowing immediately. That differentiates it from phosphorescence, where there's a delay between the absorption of the light and the readmission. It's phosphorescence that's kind of given the green glow of, of the Simpsons and of the popular imagination to nuclear waste. It's really hard to associate the fluorescing of uranium glass like this, which is the electrons in the uranium absorbing the, the UV light and then immediately re-emitting them at a very specific energy level, and that's this green wavelength. So it's a cool effect, but it's hard to say. I agree with uh, my friend and colleague, James Krellenstein, he says that no, it's the phosphorescence of other materials like radium compounds that gives the, gives the popular green glow rather than the fluorescence of this glass. But that's an example of a, uh, an aspect of the electron configuration rather than the nucleus. But the nucleus having a mass difference, it's very small, barely 1%, is what's giving us the ability to sort uranium-235 from U-238, which is the essential process, this concentrating process of getting more of the light nucleuses and fewer of the heavy nucleuses, more of the light isotopes, that is the same element but just different numbers of neutrons from the heavier ones. So these gas centrifuges spin very fast. 
we take out the gas with a slightly higher percentage of U-235 than at the start of the cylinder, and we do this over and over and over through a cascade of multiple gas cylinders, and that's what allows us to get a higher concentration of U-235. How high? Well, higher than the 3.5, 3.6, 3.7% of the naturally occurring reactors from billions of years ago in Gabon, up to about 4.8% is about the highest levels of enrichment currently being used in reactors today. Those higher levels of enrichment, again, allow a longer residence time of the fuel in the reactor. That means potentially longer times between refuelings, giving nuclear its incredible property of just going for years without a stop. Right, right. So you get that gas and that's, that's then turned into... I mean, right now, ceramic fuel pellets, maybe metal fuels in the future, other other kind of options down the road. But um, when you, when you get the gas of- back out, when you get the gas back out of the enrichment stage, you now have cylinders of uranium hexafluoride that are just higher concentrations of U two thirty five versus U two thirty eight. These cylinders will then go to a facility, sometimes the same facility, to be deconverted, converted back into the forms of uranium necessary for fuel. So UO2 is the vast majority of this. There's occasionally a little bit of U308 used to get exactly the right grain properties and and density properties in the final pellet. But once you have uranium dioxide, then this needs to be compacted and centered and made into these precisely machined, exactly machined little pellets with ultra tight tolerances. They're like each one a little work of art. It's uh, when you hear about each of these steps, it's almost a wonder that we can afford nuclear fuel at all. But uh, that's that what I was going to say. The main yeah. thing that allows us to compare uranium in this uranium masterclass to the gas and the gas masterclass and even the coal. And that is about a 100,000 to one ratio of coal to uranium needed for the same amount of generated heat. And then with gas, the numbers just get ridiculous because gas is several hundred times less dense than coal at standard temperatures and pressures. You need, in terms of volume, uh, you need about 600 times more volume than that 100,000 times more coal. When compressed into liquefied natural gas, it's similar similar to coal. So 100,000 times more LNG than, than the little bitty pellet you would need to power your life for a year. Which is, I think, which is what makes like the uranium cycle. And I don't, this isn't a podcast where we're going to get into like investment theses and things like that, but because you can stockpile uranium, it's not something that's being consumed um, so quickly after it's produced, like petroleum or gas, it leads to these kind of the cyclical nature. I mean, I guess petroleum is also cyclical in terms of, of, of sales and things like that. But I just, I'm struck by this ability because of how concentrated it is to store up large amounts of it, to bolster energy security, um, even for countries that don't produce their own uranium, like there's something there's something special beyond the energy density here, which speaks to where and why nuclear gets deployed around the world in island nations that are fossil fuel or even uranium poor, like Japan or functional islands like South Korea. Well, it's said that the greatest energy storage system in the world is the American natural gas pipeline, which holds holds. Uh, uh, I believe it's hundreds or even low thousands of terawatt hours of heat at any given moment. Well, if you want, you can set up a bank for nuclear fuel and you can stockpile at any point of that process, fuel assemblies ready to go. Now that's not as common because fuel assemblies are precisely manufactured for the working conditions inside each nuclear core. So there's people at each power plant that order up an extremely precise recipe and amount of fuel with very specific dimensions from fuel suppliers. So there's a tight relationship between a fuel supplier and a nuclear plant supplier. Doesn't mean there can't be multiple fuel suppliers. And in fact, Western fuel suppliers, Westinghouse in particular, stepped in to provide an alternative to Russian fuel suppliers for fueling Soviet designed reactors around Central and Eastern Europe when tension started really boiling over, especially in 2014 with the capture of Crimea, uh, people with Russian design plants, with Soviet design plants, worked hard to make sure that other fuel suppliers could precisely machine exactly the shape and exactly the type of fuel needed 
for their reactors. So it's not like you can't get alternatives. It's just you, if you're stockpiling uranium fuel, best not to do it at the stage where the last bits of machining are done. Now, from the perspective of each plant, sure, you can stockpile more of your own fuel if you know what you want your core loads to be at different times. So where would you stockpile? One possibility, probably one of the smartest, is uh, uranium dioxide already in an enriched state or U308 in an enriched state down converted from UF6, uranium hexafluoride. Or you could store concentrated uranium-235 in the form of uranium hexafluoride. And in fact, uh, you could store the unenriched part. So at each one of these steps, you could bank an immense amount of the world's energy uh, by just a tiny area dedicated to this. Because it's so energy dense, you don't need the entirety of the American pipeline system with all the natural gas storage caverns to su supply that amount of energy. You would just need uh, to ramp up production for a few years above the needs of current reactors and stockpile the components along that process. The IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, has in fact established a LEU, low enriched uranium, so between 3 and 5% fuel bank in Kazakhstan to give countries the uh, certainty or at least the confidence that they will be able to get fuel even with disruption of supplies in the case of war. And this is an, a gesture by the IAEA to encourage countries to forgo their own independent overproduction of different fuel supply components um, because that can lead to issues like say Iran claiming we don't trust the West, we don't trust anyone, we want our own enrichment, our own conversion, we want our own steps to fuel our own reactors and the same enrichment that gets you from 0.7% uranium-235 up to 3, 4 or 5% for today's reactors, that exact same process on the same machines can get you up to 20% which is the line for, for commercially acceptable fuels today. That's considered the HALU, high assay, low enriched uranium is at 5% to 20%. Above that, you start to get to, say, military grades, where some of the uh, most powerful and effective military reactors are going to be operating above 80% enriched uranium, and bomb-grade uranium is 90% and above. Okay, so get this, Mark. I, uh, I was preparing at length for this, uh, the Great Canadian Nuclear Debate. You can look back in the show notes uh, a couple of episodes ago. Um, and ended up speaking a lot to folks working in uh, medical uh, and research reactors making isotopes. We make them in our big candor reactors at scale, certain ones like cobalt-60, lutetium-177. But um, we also have a 59-year-old reactor um, at my alma mater, McMaster University, went to medical school. Um, and they make a lot of the world's uh, iodine-125 used for um, uh, these brachytherapies for prostate cancer, a number of other cool medical isotopes. And I really deep-dived it with them because... Um, I thought this was a really interesting area um, to, to draw attention to in the debate because nuclear technology runs the breadth, as we've seen. The reason I'm bringing this up, um, they, in the last decade, um, they've started to run research reactors on less enriched uranium. They've come down to the HALU level. Up until about 10 years ago, those research reactors were using 90% plus highly enriched uranium, which I thought was just crazy wild they can run for a really long time chris without me i'm being, sure they can need to be refueled yeah no absolutely absolutely it's absolutely fascinating and, and i don't want to get too sidetracked with it but um absolutely phenomenal the work happening at uh, the mcmaster research reactor they do um neutron radiography there every single um blade on every uh, jet turbine made in north america makes its way through that facility for the quality control uh, mechanisms that are required so Really cool stuff happening at those research reactors. And yes, up until recently, they were using 90 plus percent enriched uranium. They've converted um, to, to the halo you were just mentioning. Now, you did see something interesting. We've been talking about the stockpiling, about national security stuff. Um, obviously, we've been big on poking Germany um, for its reliance on Russian natural gas. But in regards to that question of energy security and Russia um, producing, I think, over about 43 percent of the world's enriched uranium, how is Russian natural gas dependence any different than Russian uranium and rich uranium dependence for countries like Europe and even the U.S.? So first of all, to disentangle something, Russia uses about as much uranium as it produces. 
the issue people have is that there are aspects of the fuel cycle like the conversion and deconversion to and from uranium hexafluoride for use in the enrichment stage and the enrichment stage itself where German reactors did have contracts for some of this process through Russian entities. Well, here's the big one. If Russia cuts you off today from fuel, you have up to a year and a half or even longer, up to two years maybe, before that stops your reactor, if you somehow can't get it from anywhere else in the world, which would be doubtful. You would almost certainly be able to find quantities of fuel somewhere, and it's possible to scale up pretty much each of these parts of the process, more enrichment, more mining, more conversion, pretty rapidly. The reason why companies don't like to scale up their capacity rapidly is because it can completely tank market prices. And once that happens, the industry splits between the people benefiting from the crashing prices and fuel components, that is the nuclear operators, for example, and the folks that that need higher prices to not go bankrupt. That is the people who expanded their factories all of a sudden. So the issue isn't so much can we, the issue is are we offering guarantees to expand that production to the people who would have to invest a lot of money to expand their facilities if we're needing to prepare for a cutoff of Russian fuel. So one issue is that length of time you have, which is much longer. If the gas stops flowing through pipelines and your storage, even if your storage was filled, you, the clock is ticking. You have a very small amount of time before you burn through your gas stockpiles at the rate that German industry and power plants use them. That is not the case with the uranium in the plants itself. So it's, uh, it, it's just fundamentally dishonest. Also, the cost of getting uranium fuels into the plant, even if it sharply jumps, if you have to switch from your Russian contracts to other suppliers, it barely affects the cost of production of nuclear energy itself. So uh, one of the basic rules of thumb is that the fuel, everything from the mining, milling, uh, conversion, enrichment, deconversion, fuel fabrication, delivery, installation in the reactor, that's going to be something between 20% and a third of the cost of generating nuclear electricity. That's just not enough to make nuclear uncompetitive against pretty much any other way of making stable power in Europe. So which is, which is astounding gas, when you gas power, when you describe the complexity. The yeah, when you describe the complexity of, you know, how to actually make enriched fuel, it's astounding that it's such a small piece of the the final kilowatt hour price. And that, that's just the extreme amount of energy you get out of each uh, fission reaction. I think we may have said this on a previous podcast, but just in case splitting one uranium atom compared to burning one methane molecule, so CH4, which would be the stuff that, that most of what Russia was getting through pipelines from Germany, just tells you this massive difference. So oxidizing or burning, combusting one CH4 molecule into CO2 and H2O gives you about 10 electron volts of heat energy to play around with. Splitting one uranium atom gives you about 200 million electron volts to play around with, with various losses and inefficiencies and, and uh, you know, issues along the way, you're down to about 100,000 to one difference in the uh, mass of the fuels needed to make similar amounts of electricity. So you don't, get, you don't get all of that back, you get a lot of it back. That's the difference that allows independence, even when dealing with other people's uranium supplies, even dealing with other people's fuel supplies. Well, let's uh, maybe close the loop here by talking a little bit about how much uranium we actually have. I mean, for those of us who are uh, proponents for increasing the share of uh, energy and electricity that we get from nuclear, um, one of the, the frequent objections is, you know, that's a great plan, but we're going to run out in 70 years. Um, you know, I've, I've seen different estimates, such as the one I just referenced there, and also Nick Turan's uh, done some work on this. Um, this obviously involves talking a little bit about um, fast neutron reactors. Um, without getting too far into those weeds, um, what are your opinions on, on the sustainability, the renewability of, of uranium and nuclear? It's renewable. So uranium is constantly coming up to the crust, 
going going into crust rock and being deposited into the oceans. And it's been happening for billions of years. So we have an immense amount of uranium out there, depending on what concentration we decide is acceptable for mining. Because uranium is such a small percentage of the price of fuel, then the price of uranium can go up drastically and make all the uranium investors rich beyond their wildest imaginations without stopping nuclear energy from being cost effective. And you can do that by not only finding more Cigar Lake mines or more MacArthur River mines or Olympic Dam mines like in Australia. You can find more of these deposits if there was a resource bubble, a resource cycle where a sustained period of higher prices drove aggressive exploring, you would find more of these pockets. But we can also, in the end, do two major things. One, we can breed more fuel, that is use existing uranium hundreds of times more effectively, uh, even up to thousands, depending on which processes we're talking about, how complete the recycle is of the fuel. So for example, in France, France recycles its fuel once to get about double the energy out per uh, atom of mined uranium. So that's pretty good. But if you were then to run reactors that breed more fuel out of existing 238, then you start to open up a fairly extreme amount of energy. You start looking at current existing proved resources in mines ready to roll, if prices were to rise high enough, of several thousand years of fuel to provide the primary energy for all of human civilization at a wealthy standard for 10 billion people. You're in the low thousands of years if you're using breeder reactors. At the point that you open your resources to include, say, thorium, and if you open your resources to, say, use special sponges and mats to actually filter uranium out of the ocean, like these sort of artificial kelp beds of uranium filtering material, that you then squeeze out to get the, you get the uranium minerals. Once you do that and combine it with breeders, you're looking at several billion years of fuel in combination with land-based resources. At that point, Chris, you're going to last until the star burns off the Earth's atmosphere, which is our star, the sun, which if it doesn't give us enough uh, uranium to make it worth our while, I'd just as soon uh, not prefer to have our atmosphere burned off. Th at that point, you're going to have issues with, say, solar panels and wind turbines anyway. So when you add up all these processes, you have dozens of years with no changes, hundreds of years with a few changes, thousands of years with a few more changes, and millions to billions of years with harvesting more and being more efficient with your use of those uh, in future reactors. And a, a number of countries have worked on these fast breeder reactors and are continuing to work today. I myself, just a few days ago, visited Argonne National Labs, where fast breeder technology was really pushed forward earlier. And I saw the test facilities they're going to use to help reactor developers, of which there are many, show that their safety shutdown and cooling system, passive cooling natural circulation cooling systems for these fast breeder reactors will work, at which point you need to commercialize the recycling technology that would recycle, uh, efficiently recycle the isotopes that could be put back in the reactor to be bred and burned more, and then you're off to the races. You're good for a few billion years at that point. Very interesting. Well, we're certainly going to have some episodes to follow up on, on this notion of fast reactors. That's a bit of a hole um, in the, uh, the decouple archives to this point. Uh, but Mark, um, this is an excellent uh, recap and review. I've learned a lot. Um, anything else that you wanted to touch on today um, to put the bow on on this uh, Uranium Masterclass? Just to re-emphasize the beauty of this story, stellar collisions and, and explosions gave us our uranium. Our uranium then showed up on Earth and helped make life possible. The life helped through weathering, through, through uh, production of oxygen, helped concentrate the uranium into the mines where we can now find it efficiently and easily when we're just a baby species, just beginning to get our foothold in nuclear energy that will power us to the stars. And that's going to help us protect the rest of the biosphere. I think that's such an extraordinary story that makes me feel, even as somebody who's been involved in nuclear for a decade now, makes me feel even better 
about the rightness, the naturalness, but also the agency that uranium has given us to to write our own fate, environmentally and socially. Well, I think no one will question your enthusiasm and, and, and faith in the atom now, Mark, if they ever did before. Um, thank you for coming back on Decouple, my friend. Um, I'm sure this one's going to be a big hit. And uh, we gotta got a catch up going on the Petroleum Masterclass and, and so much more. So looking forward to, uh, to those happy occasions. But for now, my friend, um, good luck and, and farewell. And we'll see you back soon on Decouple. See you again soon, Chris.